Hello, everybody. Welcome to Pro Life is the New Punk Rock. I'm Brian Kemper, president of Stand True Pro Life Outreach, the youth outreach of Priests for Life. Today, I want to talk a little bit about pro life and the arts, whether it be music, movies, different uh, art forms that we use to bring the pro life message. And I couldn't think of a better guest than somebody who's been involved in some of my favorite movies and so much more. Jason Jones. Jason, how are we doing today? I'm doing good, Mr. Kemper. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad surviving out here in Ohio. Uh, we got a little cold, but it warmed back up, so I'm happy. My California blood doesn't do well in the cold. I do not know how. I could not live north of Dallas. Well, you know, you got to you got to do what you got to do sometimes. And if it's for the babies, if it's for the Lord, then I'm willing to do it. But uh, I really wish he would call me like to a beach again. <laughs> right. Oh, maybe we'll do something with you in Hawaii. Are you missing Hawaii, brother? You know, I just was there and I miss my Hawaii. I miss what Hawaii was before yes. the Orwellian COVID restrictions. That's why my family moved to Texas. <laughs> And a year ago, anticipating that they would never loosen up. And right now, you have to take a COVID test every 48 hours if you want to go to a restaurant or the mall, uh, go to a sporting event. Every 48 hours, you need to take a COVID test. You know, so and I don't miss what's happening there, but hopefully we'll, we'll get through this. The people of Hawaii are standing up, and I think, I don't think they're going to tolerate it much longer. Praise God. So, Jason, tell us a little bit. Give me uh, like a little bio about yourself, how you got involved in pro-life and movie business and such. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, well, you're a part of my story, Mr. Kemper, you know. So uh, when I was, I did like you, I think I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up in a family that was involved in politics or cultural issues. My mother had me when she was 16 and... Um, my journey, my involvement in the pro-life movement, or as we'd say in the film business, my inciting incident was a Saturday morning when my high school girlfriend rode her bicycle to my house and uh, walked up the stairs to my room and woke me up with the words, I'm pregnant. And it was two days before my 17th birthday. We both, as strange as it might sound, I, as a 16-year-old about to be 17, had always dreamt of being a father and, and having a home and being a strong man, a good man, a man that would provide. So for me, this was kind of like the adventure's beginning. And so on my birthday, I knew of a program where you could go into the, the military in the middle of your senior year because a friend of mine entered this program. So on my birthday, I went down to the recruiter's office and you needed your principal and, your, and a parent to sign a form uh, saying that you were kind of troubled and i was last in my class out of 565 students my principal was eager to sign that form my mother signed the form of course we didn't tell anyone about the pregnancy and a few uh i think eight weeks later yeah i was off to fiction center in fort benning then fort benning georgia uh, i had to take my ged first pass that and then do the paperwork went off to fort benning while i was in basic training not long before I was to come home, and then we were going to tell our parents, my high school girlfriend, who I think you've met, she was wearing baggy sweaters and trying to hide the pregnancy, but her father found out. He actually found out because she asked her her friend's mother, who was a doctor, for prescription vitamins. She was taking vitamins from the store, but she thought now that she's further along, she should probably get prescription vitamins. Her friend's mother wrote her the prescription, and then... um she started drinking on a Friday night, the friend's mom, and called her father and told her. And the very next morning, he took her to Illinois Masonic Hospital, where she had a forced third trimester abortion. She called me and told me what happened. I didn't even know abortion. I had, I had not, I did not only, not only did I not know it was legal, but as strange it might, as that might sound, I really didn't understand that it was a thing. And when she told me that it happened, I remembered a joke I heard in the locker room as a freshman. Guys, were, well, it wasn't really a joke. Guys, the senior kid was passing the hat around because one of the players got a, a girl pregnant and he, and he was asking everyone to throw money in the hat. And God forbid, I probably threw some money in the hat, too. I didn't really know what was going on. And he said, you know, we're raising up a fund uh, for Planned Parenthood. You know their motto, 
uh, you F them, we pluck them. And I had thought of that. Like I was trying to wrap my mind around what was going on and what had happened. My drill sergeant, uh, my captain explained to me what happened, gave me a, my, she had called me. I was cleaning pots and pans on detail. Friend called me, your girlfriend's on the phone crying. I ran out, wasn't supposed to be on the phone. It went right after she didn't actually tell me, she couldn't tell me. She just was crying and crying. Her father grabbed the phone and said, we know your secret and your secret's gone. And the drill sergeant reached over my shoulder, hung up the phone, and I punched him. They dragged me into my captain's office, and I just was crying, saying, call the police. My girlfriend's father killed my baby. And when I explained to my captain what happened, when I explained to my captain what happened, he looked a bit confused. And he said, don't you know abortion's legal? And he explained to me and gave me a roll of quarters, said, go to the PX and comfort your girlfriend. And then for, that, for, for me, that was the beginning. I just wanted to, to tell the world. I didn't think anyone knew. I thought this must hardly ever happen. Uh, it's some secret thing that must happen very rarely and no one knows and I'm going to tell the world. And so that was the beginning for me of my pro-life activism. Now, I, um, I think I met you the first time uh, doing a concert in Crystal yeah. City, Virginia, one of the early yeah. Rock for Life concerts. Uh, you weren't you weren't even a Christian at that point when you no. showed up at this show and you see these hardcore kids that, you know, normally at a pro-life event, you see a group like mine show up. People would run and hide. Yeah. But, uh, tell us about that night. Well, first of all, yeah, that was a great night. I It was the same night as the black tie and boots ball for George W. Bush's recent. You know, it was uh, it was the same. It was it was the weekend of the inauguration. Right. Mm -hmm. And. I had just moved from Hawaii a couple of months before, and uh, I had somehow, you know, I'm resourceful, Brian. I somehow got tickets to the black tie and, and boots ball, which was a big deal, especially for some kid in his 20s who just arrived from Hawaii. And my friend, she was from a very, I'm not going to say you, you would know, you know who I'm talking about. My friend at the time, she was from a very wealthy family uh, from another country. She, and we, and we found out, I don't know, at the last minute, I found out there was a Rock for Life event at Crystal City. So we skipped the black tie and boots ball. And we show up at your event. She's wearing, like, you know, fur coat and da-da-da. And uh, we show up. Well, and the reason why I wanted to go is you were my hero. You know, as a young atheist in the pro-life movement, the evangelical Christian guy with the tattoos that goes to rock festivals is my kind of, is my kind of guy. I tell people this all the time that you and I were the beginning of diversity in the pro-life movement. You know, me in the early yeah. 90s, uh, the atheist and Ayn Rand objectivist pro-lifer, you as the evangelical Christian. And it was with tattoos and listen to this strange music, which, and I tell people, I use you as an example, that you made your tribe pro-life. You brought them along with you. You didn't leave your tribe. You didn't join the movement in affect. You know, I'm one of you now, and I'm going to act like you. And I wasn't going to affect that. I wasn't going to affect for the Christians either. I was just going to be me. Um, yes. I mean, I think I would try to, you know, put on a little show for the Christians and, aw, shucks, I'm one of you. But it never really worked because they'd be like, is that tequila I smell? But uh, I would do my best. So to meet you, I was so nervous. My palms were sweaty. And uh, at the booth was Tina Whittington and Eric. And I, and I was like, where's Brian? And there's this band. So it was a really big deal for me. And I tell people, when you're in the pro-life movement, all of my heroes are now my friends. I tell people, my heroes, I have their cell numbers. Like, I have the cell numbers for all of my heroes. And you and Alan Keyes in the 90s were sort of, and Christine O'Donnell, Christina, Christine was always on Politically Incorrect, right? I, yeah, I, 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 and I used to do festivals with Christine O'Donnell, and I think we actually were in the studio once filming Politically Incorrect, but opposite days. We were both there for the yeah. And Alan and Key's she, daughter used to work with Rock for Life. Oh, I didn't know that. So yes. I, don't, I don't know if you know this. I was, uh, I think, director of Rock for Life. I think for yeah, a couple yeah, of months. You, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, no. So that was something. And to meet you and uh, to be there at that rock festival uh, for me was really exciting. So, Jason, um, m one of my things has been I, I love music. I've been involved in music. On a previous episode, I had uh, Jim Chaffin, the drummer of The Crucified, who was the first band that I ever heard a pro-life song from. And that really changed my life. And that was back in 1987. Um, 
but I've always believed that the arts are something that um, can be used to truly show the beauty of God and to truly show his truth. And I think, I think looking at a lot of movies and TV shows and music, I see that even when it's not even intended, it's not even intended to be that pro-life message, but because art imitates life and because there's so much truth there um, that we see that a lot. But one of one of my favorite um, summers was you had given me a call and um, got me on the phone with this car dealer who was financing uh, a movie. Uh, he, uh, I believe it was Mr. Wolfington. And um, yeah. you talked to me about this film that you guys were making or had made and were finishing up. And how you wanted me to take the preview and, and materials to all the Christian music festivals around the country, and which we ended up doing. And that movie, to this day, um, I, I literally watched it about three weeks ago and still weeped and, and still cried, was Bella. And um, tell me a little bit about how that came about, how, how you got involved in this movie that I believe has saved thousands of lives and documented saved thousands of human lives yeah well you know my first movie though even before bella you are in uh it's it's called uh what the heck was it gates of hell i don't know if you remember that joe Gigani and i and Kristen and and, and christine o'donnell made a little little award-winning documentary in the summer of 2001 where we went to rock festivals and interviewed young people on their yes. thoughts of abortion and so, you know, I was always looking at media and storytelling and film and, and radio, which was where I started doing radio in college. Uh, but how I got involved in narrative feature films was really just God's grace. I had been invited to go to Mexico City to join a, a collection, uh, sort of a group of folks that were looking at trying to change the tide of an election in Mexico and also the, the culture wars in Mexico. And while we were there, Eduardo Verastegui, Leo Severino, Sean Wolfington, and Sean Wolfington, uh, Alejandro Monteverdi, the writer director of, of, of Bella and Steve McAvity, the producer of the passion of the Christ, they were all, the, they were all there and they were there seeking additional funding for this movie, Bella. And that film was all but done. And there was a very rough cut that they were going to show at midnight. I had no clue what this movie was going to be about, not at all. In fact, I tried to get out of going to this meeting in Mexico. Um, I tried to get out of going to screen the film because you know how we screen films. We It's always after a long day of meeting, someone brings a movie and they want to show it at midnight. And that's exactly what this was. And we had to take cars across Mexico City. And we went to, I think it was a Disney uh, studio, a Disney facility. And they had a theater there. And it was late. It was we were tired. It was hot. It's, you know, Mexico City, the altitude is high as well. So I was just tired. I wanted to go to my hotel room, get a tortilla soup and a Coca-Cola and go to sleep. But I we ended up going because Marie Smith, Congressman Chris Smith's wife, dragged me, really forced me to go. We get there and we have to wait. They're having trouble with this DVD. And there's this guy in a suit and tie who is very kind and he's getting waters for everyone. And I go to help him get waters. And I think he is Eduardo's personal assistant because he's young and turns out he's this very successful entrepreneur in the auto industry, Sean Wolfington. So here I am thinking, I, you know, with Sean thinking he's the assistant, we're getting water for all the sort of VIP folks that are in the room. And I was going to, there were these big plush chairs. I was just going to go to sleep and the movie starts and I hear, if you want to hear God laugh, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. Oh, and wow. This really, yes. this, right? Remember that? So that caught oh, yeah. my attention because I am a meticulous planner. At 19, I made a 40-year plan on how I would order my life to end abortion, which included movies, by the way. So my eyes opened and then just scene by scene by scene, it's such a unique and creative, even in this really rough early form such a unique and creative and beautiful film and i fell into it and uh for reasons beyond it being pro-life that i'm not really very open about uh it just i knew god wanted me to be the first person in the world to see that movie and i couldn't believe it i couldn't believe it. i honestly 
uh, I thought I must have died. I said, is this purgatory? What's going on? Like, what's how this is such a strange what? And uh, so it really touched me. And I walked up to Sean and the guys and I said, hey, I've spent my whole life doing favors for people. I have a lot of chits I can cash in. Um, anything I can do for you, uh, just let me know. And well, of course, some of the wealthiest people in the world were in the room and they were like, yeah, thanks, guy. Bye. But I think a lot, they all passed. And a couple weeks later, they asked me to go to Notre Dame uh, because Uncle Eustace, Eustace Wolfington, uh, together with Shadu Finance, the film is a Notre Dame a grad. And they, so they, they showed it at Notre Dame. And I, I asked my sister to come. My sister had the same feeling, like, wait a second, huh? How, wait, what? Uh, because, you know, for, for our family, there's something very intimate about something very personal in the film yes. uh, for us. And so my sister was like, that's strange. And I said, right. And then they hadn't raised the money yet. So I said, I can, I think I can raise the money. It was a lot of money. And I had just built over, I think, 15 years of being a, a young doer for people in the movement. I made some phone calls to some of my friends and they all, they stepped up and uh, it was Bob Atwell and uh, Mark Follett. Uh, they stepped up and they, they were the, uh, they financed the, the distribution and p a for the film and the finishing funds. And I, I went off to run Brownback's campaign as his national grassroots director while they were getting a distribution deal. We went on to win Toronto International Film Festival. To be there for that was amazing. And um, they called me and asked me how I wanted to be listed on the credits and I as co-executive producer. And I'm like, well, why would I be executive producer? And they go, well, you brought us the money. I said, well, I mean, what's that? They're like, that's a pretty important part. That's called executive producers. So they, uh, I said, well, don't put Jason Jones. You don't want this film labeled anti-abortion pro-life, you know, because it really isn't. It's a true story, a beautiful story. And um, there it is. I mean, this movie to me is just the most special thing I've had a, 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 that I've produced in my pro-life work that I've had the privilege of being a part of with Crescendo. And divided hearts. Yeah, America. crescendo is absolutely amazing. Also, yeah, but without Bella, it would be none of it. So I went off to run Brownback's campaign, and then they brought me back to run the marketing campaign. And and I didn't know how to market a movie. I didn't know how to run a movie camp marketing campaign. But I had been running political campaigns since my early twenties. So we ran, and I had worked on the passion in a very small capacity with Rock for Life. Yeah, you know, yeah. So I forgot. Yeah, about you that. actually. That's when I was with Stand True. At that point, I had just started Stand True, and. And you and Mr. Wolfington called and, and we ended up taking an extra booth to every music festival and playing the trailer all day long. We had bought a, some TVs and really promoted this that summer. And it was absolutely, absolutely amazing to be involved with. One of uh, now I've seen I've met people who have kept their baby because of seeing that movie. I, I've I've heard the stories, but I think. One of my favorite stories is when Eduardo decided, I believe it was in Brooklyn um, or somewhere in New York, to go and research and to, not thinking anyone would know who he was, to go stand outside of an abortion mill to, to, to understand this. Can, can you tell us that story and, and, and the beauty of what happened there? Yeah, Eduardo, through this guy, Ed Visner, I think it was Ed's idea, uh, said, let's go to an abortion mill and stand outside and well, of course eduardo it was i think it was it was in los angeles and eduardo not no you know not okay no, it seems like a good idea jason give a little background eduardo was one of the biggest celebrities in south america at this time oh yeah he's, he was, mm -hmm. they call him the brad pitt of latin america and you know it was fun like when i met him in mexico city we'd walk around and we'd get chased and i i said to eduardo the first day when we got chased i said you know uh, brother, if you want to hang out with me, get used to it because every day is just like this. And he looked at me, oh, Frater, you need to learn the virtue of humility. Um, I don't know if they're coming after you. <laughs> but <laughs> They were chasing Papi, yeah? <laughs> I, go, hey, Frater, I, I said, I think these Mexican girls like blind guys. That's why they keep chasing us around the city. Yeah. But yeah, no, he was a big celebrity. So then he goes to this. Imagine a young woman's going to an abortion clinic and there's Brad Pitt saying, can I talk to you about what you're thinking, what you're feeling? what you're going through. And what ended up happening is the very, they recognized them, which he, I don't think he thought it through, you know, and they recognized them. And before the film was even made, before the script was finished, 
Well, Eduardo was doing research, and it took, by the way, Eduardo Loss, when he came to his Catholic faith after making Ch Chasing Poppy, saying, you know, I never want to make a film again that portrays Latinos in a negative light. I never want to be in a film again that portrays Latina women, uh, that you know, the way that they portray them in films. And, and, and the Latin Mexican men are always Don Juans or drug dealers or Casanovas. You know, when Bella came out, uh, we won an award from La Raza. And all of these families would say they've never seen in a movie their families uh, portrayed accurately, which yes. is, you know, you and I, we're, we're surrounded my whole life. You know, my uh, we've been surrounded by this culture. But the, so we know what it's like. But yeah, Hollywood doesn't portray it accurately. And they said, thank you for just letting us see our family for once on the big screen. And that was really Alejandro's goal. And he had this true story that he built the movie around. So he didn't set out to make pro-life mm -hmm. apologetics. In fact, um, there is no pro-life apologetics in the film. It's just, no, it's, it's just, just true. beautiful life. It's, yeah. it's, it's positivity. It's life. It's, it's family. Um, the scene dinner at, at his parents' house is, is probably one of the most beautiful scenes in the world, in my opinion. Yes. But tell us what happened when he was out in front of that abortion mill. Yeah, so what happened is while he was just trying to do research, it, it, he, all of these women said, well, we really don't want to do this. We feel we have to do this, da, da, da. And so the very first day of research, Eduardo talked to a young woman, and just in the conversation, she chose life. I mean, to me, that right there it made the whole movie worth it. Right. Obviously, in Schindler's yeah. List, there's that line, which I think about a lot now uh, because I my organization is very active in, in the Afghanistan rescue mission and it's not cheap. And we're having to weigh like Tajiks are more expensive than Pashtun and Americans are more expensive mm -hmm. than everybody. And how much money do we have? And I keep thinking of this Oscar Schindler quote, how much is a life worth? Well, how much is a movie? Bella costs two point nine million dollars to make and a lot more than that to market and distribute. And well, before the movie was even made, uh, I think the return on investment was made, and the Absolutely. first day of research on the first day of research. Absolutely, uh, it's and I've seen, I've talked to people who ha have been affected that much by this movie. I've talked to couples who have kept their babies. I remember going to the premiere the first night. I was in Chicago, Illinois, uh, for another event, and we we left that event early to go to to the theater, and we ended up having to wait for the second showing because the first one was full, which was super exciting. Cause I was like, yeah, man, I, I, I put a lot of effort into promoting and they put a lot of trust. So I was hoping we did well. And I think we did, but well, um, Brian, you, you're, you're really responsible for the birth of movie to movement in a way, because you know, we made the movie and then we partnered with you and other groups, but you were our, you are our, literally our rock star and Sean Wolfington just adored you. And I remember how excited he was to buy you TVs and pay for booth costs, this and that, that. And I thought, this is amazing. We have a, a movie, a for-profit business. That's what a movie is. And it's paying pro-life groups. It's giving them this great resource, this excitement of a celebrity. It's buying the material and things they can use. It's subsidizing the cost of the tour. I thought, I can do this with movie after movie after movie to bring money from Hollywood into the pro-life movement. And at the same time, we're doing our mission, right? And uh, and so, yeah, the, the, the great job you did at, at filling theaters was unbelievable. Can I tell you my favorite Bella Baby story? And maybe please do. OK, so and we lost touch. Well, we never really had touch. So I was emceeing the Students for Life of America event several years ago. And I was on stage and we were doing a movie to movement film where hope grows. And I was there. <laughs> and so the star of the film as this incredible actor with Down syndrome and, and, uh, and several stars of the film were there. And, but I was also emceeing the event. So I'm emceeing the students for life of America, this big event. And I have to also manage these celebrities. Um, and it was a marathon event. If you remember, I don't know, it seemed like it was forever. And I was on that stage a lot uh, all day. And my assistant, uh, kept coming saying, there's this young woman here and she wants to meet with you. I'm like, well, I'll have a break like in two hours. Well, she can't wait two hours. She just took the bus here from Philadelphia. She took the bus to the train, uh, a, 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 a 
bus to the train, a train to DC. And then from the train, she took a bus to here in Maryland. And um, she has to get back home. She's a high school student. She has to be back to Philadelphia tonight. She just could come for the day. And she really needs to talk to you. I'm like, I, I can't talk to her. She said, well, she's pregnant. I'm like, this is strange. I'm like, okay, can you bring her back here? So there, there's a picture of it I have on my Facebook. So this, this pregnant woman, young woman comes back and we're talking and she goes, Mr. Jones, and my, I was scheduled to have an abortion. In my Spanish class, the teacher showed us Bella. I, I changed my mind and I wanted to know more about people who made the film. And I, I found out all about you and I saw you were gonna be so close to me and you live in Hawaii and that you call your babies Bella babies. So I just thought you'd wanna know you know, this is a Bella baby and, you know, you, you can touch the, my belly and, and say hi to the, your next Bella baby. And so we called Eduardo. I touched her belly. Hey, Bella baby. And I called Eduardo and she talked to Eduardo. Then I had to run back on stage and MC the event. And then off she went. And, you know, the fact that the Wolfington family is a big Philadelphia family um, and that this young woman went all this way to come find us. I really wanted to connect with her and see what kind of help she needed or anything, but it was just, she disappeared off. That's just another story. Uh, we have so many stories like that. Another fa favorite story I have is I was in Toronto for a, several years later for the Toronto Film Festival, the stoning of Soraya M. And I was getting a haircut and the young woman who was cutting my hair was Chinese. And she, I asked her what her favorite movie was. And she said, it's this little movie you probably never saw. It's called Bella. It actually won Toronto a couple of years ago. I said, oh, really? That's your favorite movie? I'm like, how did you see it? Did you see it at the theaters or when it was at the festival? She's like, no, I bought it in Chinatown for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that, 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 that's funny. That kind of reminds me. We have about two minutes left. That reminds me. I was in New Zealand on a, on a speaking tour, and uh, I had about a seven-hour break in, uh, in Christchurch, and I walked into a tattoo parlor. And I'd always wanted a, a, a Maori design because I'd lived in the Cook Islands. I was a missionary in the Cook Islands a long time ago. And I walk into this tattoo parlor in Christchurch, New Zealand, and this kid behind the counter looks up and goes, are you Brian Kemper? I've been following you on social media for 20 years. Like, and I'm just like, it blows my mind. how. And, and then he introduced me to this Maori tattoo artist who I told him about my pro-life passion and stuff. And designed a tattoo for me and it was just beautiful what god does because you we don't go anywhere expecting someone to know oh that you're there i mean maybe at the march for life or something but it's it's amazing how god can use that and and like eduardo said we we need to remember that humility because i think that's when god will use us the most is when we can do that but jason we're just about out of time and i'm gonna have you on again because i want to talk about the movie crescendo being I grew up, um, you know, with spinal meningitis and, and being told that I was going to be nothing for the rest of my life. And, and, and I watched that movie Crescenda. And again, I, I bawl and I weep when I see it because I know that what the world calls junk, God loves so much. Sometimes it, it, it blows us away what he does with, with people like that. And so we'll talk about that next time, but go can ahead. I, can I, I want to, I want to address Crescendo because you in a way get, credit for Crescendo too, because, you know, in the nineties, I, when I, I was very thoughtful that my pro-life work is going to, I'm going to work to use art and celebrity to change culture. And where did I get that idea? You, you know, uh, with the work you did at Rock for Life. And so to have Justin Bieber's mother and Eduardo Verastegui as my partners to make that little film Crescendo, which went on to make, raise $6 million for pregnancy centers. And it was, I mean, it won over 30 major Hollywood film festivals. So you love that film. Well, you know, I was inspired by you as a student at the University of Hawaii. And you planted that seed in my mind that I could use celebrity and art to change culture and to save lives. So, yeah, I just wanted to end with that. And I, and I look back, at, it's almost like a pay it forward thing. But I look backwards at the people that I looked up to and the people that I met and then spoke into my life and and i told the drummer of this band i'm like the fact that you guys sang that one song you had a, a, the willingness to write a song about abortion in a punk rock band in the 80s has been a domino effect to so many people because they had the willingness to do that so as i ask you to close this in prayer I, i'd like to focus on just praying that people 
will step out in courage and uh, and to never know that maybe maybe they'll never meet the people that they affect, but but know that God will use that in an amazing way. Sure, um, I'm Catholic, so forgive me. In the name of the Father, no, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Father, first of all, we know you're here with us. Uh, we thank you for thinking of us out of all eternity and for creating us and giving us the beautiful gift of life. Father God, I'm so thankful for the friendships that you have given me uh, through the pro-life movement, uh, that my heroes like Brian are my friends. I thank you for knitting together this beautiful community that lives to serve the most vulnerable members of our family, the child in the womb. And I thank you for the grace and we ask, Lord, for even more grace, irresistible grace, so that we will live in your will, that we will always have the courage to stand for life. We pray that you would pour that grace upon our country, upon our political leaders, that they would correspond their lives to the grace that you've given them, and that we could leave our children and our posterity a culture of life. Father, I especially pray for those who are watching this, um, not because they're pro-life, but because they are not, and they think they're they're researching they want to know who we are and how we think and lord i pray that you would illuminate their intellect and open their hearts to the dignity of the fragile and vulnerable child in the womb and we pray uh for everyone who's been hurt directly by abortion but especially for those women whose hearts have been been broken um because they were swept away by our culture and the spirit of our age that they were lied to by our politicians and our religious and political leaders in their schools. Um, the truth of the, their child was hidden from them until it was too late. Lord, we pray that you would heal their hearts. And I would ask that you give all of us courage to everywhere and anywhere and every time we hear not just the dignity of the child in the womb, but any of our brothers and sisters in this wonderful family of ours, the human family, when their dignity is denied or when they're suffering violence, Lord, that you would give us the courage to stand with them, to honor them, and to see every human being as they are, the most beautiful creature, created being, created creatures in the cosmos, made in your beautiful image and likeness. So give us the grace always to see that and honor that and treat people as they deserve to be treated. Now, we pray to our King, to our brother, and to our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate it. And uh, I believe uh, Bella is probably on Netflix. I, I think it's on Netflix or Hulu, one of those. So I hope people will look it up and, and, and take a look at that movie. And, and if you come to the March for Life this year, Jason and I will both be there. Come talk to us. Tell us your story. You never know what God's going to do with it and how we might use you. So I hope you'll come talk to us. And Jason, we'll definitely have you on again. I appreciate it. God bless everybody, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Pro-Life is the New Punk Rock.